we will look at all the definitions in Euclid's elements. There are 23 of them. And we look at the five postulates and we look at the five notions. Here is the start of book one. And we just make some scratch work just to see how it's going. A point is that which has no part. Essentially, it has no width, it has no length. So a point is just a point. No width, no length, no height. A line is a breathless length. There is no breadth to the line. Essentially, it means that the extremities of a line are points. So what I tell my daughter always, when you have two points, when you connect them with the shortest distance, you always get a point, uh, a straight line, pardon me. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. So all the points on the straight line lies evenly with itself. A surface is that which has length and breadth only. So this piece of paper is actually a surface. This is also a surface. It essentially has some form of a length and some, of a, some form of a breadth. The extremities of a surface are lines. So if you have this white sheet of paper, the edges are lines. Plane surface is a surface which lies evenly with the straight lines on itself. So on this white piece of paper, all the lines which lie are on the surface itself. A plane angle is the inclination to one another of two lines in a plane which meet one another and do not lie in a straight line. So if you have two lines which not lie on top of each other. So A and B don't lie on top of each other. So assume we have two lines. This orange line and this green line. You have to lie on top of each other since it's essentially the same line. <clears throat> a plane angle is the inclination to one another of two lines in a plane that they do not lie on the straight line. So if they do not lie on the straight line, then the angle formed is the diagonal. Would consider even this they'll come to it and when the lines containing the angle are straight the angle is called rectilinear so in this case you had the green line and you had the yellow line both are straight thus the angle between them is actually later on we'll get to know it's 290 degrees it's essentially a straight line when a straight line set up on a straight line makes the adjacent angle equal to one another, each of the equal angles is right. And the straight line standing on the other is called perpendicular to that on which it stands. So essentially we are saying the angles, this angle one and this angle two are equal. So one is equal to two. Then we say this line is perpendicular. So if I have to color code it, you have the orange line, you have the green line, and this angle is equal to this angle. One is equal to two. Then we say the green line is perpendicular. to the yellow line and these two angles are the same and this angle is called a right angle nowhere in the book he will say it's 90 degrees what we learn in school <coughs> an obtuse angle is an angle greater than right angle so if you have an angle something like this this would form an obtuse angle obtuse and if you have an angle smaller than 90 degrees you'll form an acute angle. So 11 and 12. A boundary is that which is an extremity of anything. So you have a 
surface. What is the boundary? Just assume it touches here, it touches here, it touches here, it touches here. This is the boundary. A figure is that which is contained in an extremity of anything. Fifteenth. This is the definition of a circle. A circle is a plane figure contained by one line such that all the straight lines falling upon it from one point among those lying within the same figure are equal to one another. So this is the figure. This straight line is equal for all the points from this point. Say this is called O, this foot. So you keep drawing all the lines. It essentially forms a circle. That's very ugly looking circle and this center is called O which is the center as a 16th a diameter of the circle is any straight line drawn through the center and terminated in both directions by the circumference of the circle and such a straight line bisects the circle so essentially semicircle you have a straight line going through the origin which is the center and touches the other side of the circumference so this edge is called circumference this half from center to the circumference is the radius and twice of radius which is a straight line from the center on either side of the circumference is the diameter. Let's go to the 18th. A semicircle is the figure contained by the diameter and the circumference cut off by it and the center of the semicircle is the same as that of the circle. This is very simple. We just have half a circle, right? And essentially you have this. So this is the diameter and this is the radius. Simple. Rectilinear figures are those which are contained by straight lines. Trilateral figures are those contained by three. Quadrilateral, those contained by four. And multilateral, those contained by more than four straight lines. So what I, what I explained to my daughter, she is just five now. You have a point. And when you have a point, it's essentially the first postulate. Point is essentially nothing. It has no part, no width, no length, no height, nothing. So she, she denotes something like zero, nothing, she says. Then she says one, she says point. Two, she says straight line. She links two points to a straight line. That's a rectilinear figure. So essentially, I'm trying to teach her 19th postulate of Euclid. And then I say, when you have three points, which are not rectilinear, and when you connect those, you have a triangle. So I've been trying to explain to her, if those three points lie in a straight line, you get a straight line again, which is again, a straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself, which is postulate 4. So, Euclid goes on to say, you have a point, you have a right line, you have a trilateral figure. Tri, three, lateral means side, three-sided figure. Then he says, a quadrilateral contained with four points. So, then my daughter talks about square, rectangles, rhombus, parallelogram. You have the four quadrilaterals, she knows, uh, she knows parallelogram, yes. Then he talks about multilateral. Then my daughter goes, sorry, I was out of the window. So this is the quadrilateral. She talks about a pentagon. She talks about a hexagon. She goes heptagon, octagon, nonagon, decagon, dodecagon. And I've been teaching her 17, which is hept plus dodec. So heptadodecagon, heptadecagon. Essentially, sorry, heptadecagon. Why 17? Because it has some unique uh, significance for Euclid and prime numbers, Fermat's prime, and even Gauss. Gauss was very fascinated and this he considered to be his biggest achievement. To construct a 17-sided polygon using a scale and a compass. That was, he wanted it to be on his tombstone, but the person who was designing the tombstone said it will essentially look like a circle. 
so that's uh, an interesting story there now coming to postulate 20 of trilateral figures an equilateral triangle is that which has its three sides equal an isosceles triangle that which has two of its sides alone equal and a scalene triangle that which has its three sides unequal so it doesn't talk about angles it's talking about sides so we have three sides equal it's an equilateral triangle you have two sides equal this is something else it's an isosceles triangle you have all three sides different you call this a scalene triangle simple <clears throat> 21 21st sorry further of trilateral figures a right angle triangle is that which has a right angle an obtuse angle triangle that which has an obtuse angle and an acute angle triangle that which has its three acute angles acute this is also fairly simple you have a right angle then you have an ob obtuse angle and then you have and say equilateral triangle which is essentially a scalene triangle uh, sorry uh, acute angle triangle now coming to postulate 22 of quadrilateral figures a square is that which is both equilateral and right angle this is nice so you have a square by equilateral euclid means same length equal length don't confuse equilateral with only triangles that's how it's gone into our memories so for square all sides are equal all the angles are right angles fairly simple then he defines an oblong which is essentially a rectangle he says all sides are 90 degrees which is right angle but all sides are not equal then he says a rhombus, which is equilateral but not right angle triangle. It's also nice. Just a few days ago, my daughter had to make something by the word R for her class. So she made a rhombus. So the rhombus properties are all sides are equal. Angles are not right angles. That's the property for rhombus. A rhomboid, which has opposite sides and angles equal to one another. But is neither equilateral nor right angle. Just think about a parallelogram. Opposite sides are equal, and angles are equal to one another. But this is not a square, nor a rhombus, or an oblong or a rectangle. Everything else is a trapezia. So essentially, what he's saying, you have a set of quadrilateral you have squares you have oblongs you have rhombus you have rhomboid you have trapezia this is what he says called right but the thing is that in the future we are we will be studying not just so this is a pentagon I'm just give an example not a quadrilateral it's essentially a convex polygon we'll we will even study concave polygons that's for later so we were on 22, 23 is the last definition. Parallel straight lines are straight lines which being in the same plane and being produced indefinitely in both directions do not meet one another to one another in either direction. So this is something I've been again explaining to my daughter. You have two straight lines. No matter how far you keep extending them, they're not going to meet. So for example, I show her the fence and I ask her, will they ever meet in the sky or inside the ground? Uh, things like that. So the common of parallel lines is a little difficult to grasp. I used to teach her when she was four. 
so uh, it's a little difficult. So now coming to the postulates, to draw a straight line from any point to any point, to produce a finite straight line continuously in a straight line, to describe a circle with any center and distance, that all right angles are equal to one another. So 90 degrees equal to 90 degrees. So 190 degrees is not different from another 90 degrees. Now this one is a, an important one, the fifth postulate, that if a straight line falling on two straight lines make the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if produced indefinitely, meet on that side on which are the angles less than the two right angles. So it's two work both, but it can be simplified. So suppose we have two lines green line, orange line, and we have a straight line which falls on these two lines. It's that simple. We say this angle, so this is an acute angle, acute angle 1, this is acute angle 2. It says the smaller of the two angles, so this is, this will be a right angle minus angle 1, and this will be right angle minus angle 2. Suppose A1 is smaller than right angle minus A1 and A2 is smaller than right angle minus A2. Then when you extend that side of this green line, that orange line, when you keep extending, they will meet at some point. It's very simple. Simplifying it again. So you have actually three cases. Suppose you have two parallel lines. If you, these two angles actually will be same. They will never meet each other. These two as extend. But in the case, the smaller angles, they will meet. And on the other side, they will never meet. It will diverge. So this is what Euclid means in the last postulate. Then comes the common notions. Things which are equal to the same things are also equal to one another. This is essentially uh, the commutative property. So I've got another book. It's on abstract algebra by, by Pinter. You can actually see uh, a commutative property. So A, say some operation with B is equal to B, some operation with A. So if you add, if you add a plus b is equal to b plus a, two plus three is equal to three plus two. Commutative property. The second uh, common notion is if equals be added to equals, the wholes are equal. <clears throat> so you have sixteen plus three is nineteen. If you add 16 plus 3 is 19, let me actually make it a variable example. So if A plus C is added, and suppose A is equal to B, and B plus C, then it, this will hold true, right? Same thing with subtraction. So if you have A equals B, and you subtract something equal, this will be same, right? And I think that's the third one. If equals be subtracted from equals, the remainders are equal. Things which coincide with one another are equal to one another. You have two lines, they coincide with each other, it's the same thing. The whole is greater than the part. So A is greater than A minus a part of A. Or A is greater than A minus a part of A. Right? So very simplistic looking these notions, postulates and definitions. But these basic things will be used to go through all 465 postulates or theorems, I should try to say, or propositions uh, in the book. Uh, we'll start with proposition one soon. Thank you.